My name is Erin Meyer. I'm the Sustainable Food Programs Coordinator at the University of California, Merced. I coordinate and conduct all things uh, sustainable foods. So, this recovery, um, I run the Bobcat Eats Food Waste Prevention Program. I also coordinate the People's Fridge, the Pop Up People's Pantry. Uh, we have a contactless food box delivery program and a few other things. So, uh, I wear many hats, but it's all saving the food and feeding the people. And um, my colleague and I, who cannot be here today, started these panel series to um, first look at films that were addressing some sustainable food or just sustainability topic. And uh, we had some panels with the film like Just Eat It and Growing Solutions. And then we decided to just do them around some certain topics. And we have themed months. So Nutrition Month was in March. In April, it was Earth Month. I started creating some events in May and they all seem to be revolving around women. Um, like our AMA that we do, we had a women, a woman panelist. So it occurred to me, maybe we should just make May um, like a celebration of women in the food system. So I decided it'd be really cool if we had um, some women from the field of cellular agriculture to get together and chat about cellular ag because I think it's a pretty fascinating technology. I think I'm going to be even more fascinated after today um, because of you all fantastic female scientists. I think I'm going to learn a lot. Um, so thank you in advance for that. Uh, but yeah, we decided to have this event. We also have a upcoming event called Women in Ag Tech, which is you know similar in name, but it'll be specifically addressing ag tech and everything. And that's on March 27th. Um, but today we're here to celebrate women in cellular ag, a new, newish, I guess it depends on how you define new, right? Maybe that could be a question. Um, newish technology to hopefully advance uh, sustainable food and um, hopefully women could be the leaders of that. I think we already are seeing as we have like six, like awesome, fantastic women in the food system here today. So enough about me and everything. We'll just start with some bios for our panelists. Um, because Mural, you're actually already unmuted. Let's just go ahead and begin with you. Do you wanna provide a brief intro? Um, I think you said Muriel, right? That's me. So yeah, my name is uh, Muriel Vernon. I am a cultural and medical anthropologist. I'm also a fellow UCLA grad or fellow UC because you guys are Merced, but you know, I think of the system as, you know, sort of a sisterhood in a way. Um, I have been interested in cellular agriculture education for a couple of years now. Um, I have a little website called followthefuture.org, which is sort of designed, you know, to connect students. Um, and I mean, early college students, but also sort of late high school, so senior level high school students to the field of cellular agriculture, not just to sort of break down what is this, why is this important, why do we need it, but why you should care and why you should get into it and how to approach this in a way that I know to, to break down because I'm an educator and I know that it's really important to make it accessible. Um, as a social scientist, um, I'm consistently in awe and I'm always learning more about the heart science aspect of cellular agriculture. And as a researcher, I've just joined the board um, of Genius Biotech, which is a company that is working on um, making cultured wood and cultured fur amongst other things. And that is really exciting because those are biomaterials. So it's almost like the next step of where SALAC is rapidly going, which is super, super exciting. And um, I'm really excited about this panel because I love conversations that move the issue forward, that bring it out into new audiences, different audiences. And um, as an anthropologist, I only know one other anthropologist who's a food anthropologist who is as passionate about cellular agriculture as I am. So I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here. Thank you, thrilled to have you. Um, all right, Akimi, could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Akemi and um, my background is in biochemistry. So I have a PhD in molecular and cell biology from UC Berkeley, and I got involved in cellular agriculture when I started working at the company Bolt Threads. So this is a company that is focused on making materials, and uh, they have a mushroom leather 
And when I was there, I was working on the spider silk team. So producing spider silk from microbes and uh, spinning that into natural uh, fibers for fashion. And since then, I have moved from fashion into food. So I am currently at Shiru, which is a company that is um, developing alternative proteins for dairy, meats, eggs, um, and we're really focused on protein discovery. So we utilize computational approaches like machine learning and uh, to identify proteins that are really functional to be uh, developed into ingredients. And we develop those proteins into ingredients uh, using fermentation. So um, producing those proteins via microbes. And I, thanks for organizing and also really excited to be here with all these fantastic people. So thanks. I'm a UC grad, I love it. Oh, cool. Yeah, all right. Um, and then, uh, Kasia, can you introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Kasia Gora. I am the CTO of Artemis Foods. So we're actually working to commercialize um, a hybrid product where we mix um, plant proteins with animal cells for flavor to create the next generation of alternative burgers. And um, I have been with Artemis for the last year. Um, thinking back on my career over the last decade, I've actually been in cell ag before people were calling it cell ag. So I think when I finished my PhD, um, we were calling it synthetic biology, which is uh, about you know using genetic engineering to um, engineer uh, cell lines or strains to to produce stuff and. You know, I've always had a passion for food and really, you know, and this might be common to some of the women on this panel, we like to nourish people with food. And I've been weirdly doing synthetic biology in the food space my entire career. So I, I've been doing cell ag before it was cool. Um, I'm new to the um, uh, cell, cell product space. So um, mostly I've worked on, on microbes historically, and um, it's been really an interesting fusion of my background in synthetic biology and industrial microbiology and bringing that um, point of view to cell-based meat and um, trying to figure out what's it gonna take to actually get good unit economics. Because at the end of the day, uh, everybody wants these products or at least forward thinkers do. They think they're, it's gonna transform sustainability of the food system. And you know, I'm super excited to use all my skills to make that um, an economic reality so, so we can create products that people can buy. And I'm very excited to be here on this panel. Uh, you know, I'm a female leader in science. There's not a lot of us. Um, I think there's lots of reasons for that, but um, I think that uh, humans supporting women and other underrepresented folks is how we all move forward together. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. You just gave me a, another uh, idea for a question about what are some of those reasons that there are more women in STEM, but before we get to those interesting questions, um, Nicole, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Yeah, uh, I'm a little underneath the weather, so you'll, I sound a little nasal. <laughs> um, but I just started, I'm actually very new to the um, cellular meat as well, but I just started with Matrix Meats uh, almost a month ago. So we're the ones building the scaffolds for it to adhere to the cells. So I'm super excited because I've been in the food industry all my life. Um, my last company I worked at was an, a startup as well, um, City Storage Systems. So we did a lot of real estate um, and a lot of food delivery. So I'm excited to get started. Thank you. Sorry to hear that, that you're feeling under the weather. So am I, unfortunately. Um, all right, I might be pronouncing this incorrectly, but Vidya, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure, you pronounced it correctly. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Vidya Chamundeshwari. I hold a doctorate degree specializing in tissue engineering and biomaterials from Singapore. Uh, after my PhD, I worked for a couple of years in the biomedical sector. And then I was kind of motivated by all this uh, potential that cell ag holds and the food sustainability sector holds and kind of shifted my career and focused towards this arena. Uh, I'm also passionate about STEM being accessible to the next generation of young girls. And in this effort, I am spearheading a few mentorship initiatives spanning across Canada, Singapore, 
India and the US. So these are the four, four places that I've lived in. So yes, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here and meet and chat you uh, with you fellow CELAG uh, enthusiasts. I'm currently the lead scientist um, heading the biomaterials engineering division at New Age Meats. As a company, we are committed to producing intensely flavorful meat that's better for you, me, the animals and the planet. I work on cell line, biomaterial development, as well as media development endeavors. Thank you for your work. Um, all right, Yadira, can you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Yes, sure. Thank you so much for the invitation, Irina. I'm really excited to be here in this panel. Uh, my name is Yadira Tejera Saldana, and I'm originally from Mexico, but I live in Canada right now. And I'm currently the uh, Research Collaborations Director at New Harvest. Uh, my background is in food science, and I've always been a food lover. And I think my career, I've dedicated it to learn about the field and all the different aspects of the agri-food sector. I would say from working in the industry, which were like my first steps, then doing research during my master's and my PhD, and then learning about food policy as well during my postdoctoral fellowship, all the way to even driving a tractor in a cornfield. So I've done a little bit of everything and yes, <laughs> and I, I, I love it. I love being involved in the agri-food sector. Um, I've always been passionate about uh, innovation and how it can help us to produce all sorts of food products, uh, especially those ones that maybe can help us decrease um, using animals as a source of protein, uh, which brings me to the reason why I became involved in the uh, cellular agriculture sector or field. Uh, the first thing I did was I co-founded a not-for-profit here in Canada called Cellular Agriculture Canada with the objective of creating more awareness about the field, um, bringing the community of people working there um, and then I finally joined New Harvest uh, at the end of 2020. Um, so that's me, and I'm really excited to be in a panel of women in the field. Already just incredibly inspired. <laughs> uh, this is going to be a fantastic conversation. Um, so I think we could go ahead and maybe begin on that question. What are some of the reasons people might think that there's not more women in STEM? Um, well, I can I can start off. I actually think there are tons of women in STEM, certainly in biology programs. That's been my experience. When you look at the number of folks um, graduating with biology related PhDs, uh, in many places, more than 50% of those people are, are actually women. Um, where I personally see attrition, um, I've made my career in the industrial space is kind of climbing up the career ladder, the higher you go, the fewer women seem to be up there. So I would say, you know, we're definitely represented in the beginning, um, but there still seems to be um, some barriers to, um, yeah, climbing the career ladder and um, enjoying leadership positions. Yeah, I will also add to that and just say that um, I think that there's not a lot of, um, I think, you know, looking at the numbers of women-led uh, companies, there's a lot less funding that goes to women founders. And so um, I think that's also can be a problem when you have uh, less women in those leadership roles. And so I think, you know, having supporting, supporting women founders as well as, um, you know, women higher up is, is something that I think everyone needs to do from, from like a, all the way from like the venture capitalist uh, space um, to help create, have more women in those leadership positions to support the women who are in the other positions like the scientist roles as well. Certainly, uh, thank you for bringing in great perspectives there. I just want to take a step backward and kind of emphasize on uh, why STEM is important for women, uh, especially women who take up roles initially and then uh, step away later. So basically, I kind of think that STEM is uh, more like uh, the driver or the engine of our economy. So this is where, this is a field where innovation occurs. It's where creativity is appreciated and loved. And I think that's also a beautiful place where women can make a very big difference. Uh, 
we can solve the problems of the world. Uh, and that's why it's important for women to go into STEM. Uh, however, as um, Cassia mentioned, uh, biological fields is about equally representative. However, in the other STEM fields, uh, the percentage of women who hold leadership positions, I actually did a fact check on this, is less than about 12%. And that is where we need the support and guidance, not just from uh, fellow um, uh, peers and fellows, but also from women. We need to support each other and uplift each other because no one else can understand us better than us. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything that has been said. And uh, I would also say that uh, as Kasia was mentioning, uh, as we climb the ladder, it's hard to start finding more people or more women that are uh, involved in science. And I think it's because of a lack of support from women. Uh, so one thing, for example, that comes to my mind is childcare support for a lot of women that work in, in uh, research, for example. That is not something that a lot of people think is important and will have an impact, but it does have an impact in, in the um, performance of women in, in research, for example. And like that, I think there's a lot of examples of other things that we can do to support women to actually be more active in, in their roles in, in, in STEM. And I think you're alluding to uh, a very interesting root cause problem, which is you know gender inequality when it comes to living life as a human on this planet and having families. Um, the fact that you know traditionally women disproportionately do the majority of unpaid labor at home. Um, you know, as a, a executive female, I can tell you I cannot be a housewife and an executive simultaneously. So I, you know, I'm in a very privileged position um, to be able to get people to help me do all those things so they all get done. But as a human being, I personally cannot do all of them. And so I think there's also this just general, you know, notion that in order for women to be successful, we have to be treated equally and have the same expectations at home as at work because um, you know men don't seem to have these child care problems yet they also have children so why is it not their problem um, but that's that's a that's a bigger question I will leave to the anthropologist you can answer how we got this much sexual dimorphism <laughs> and expectations I don't know I don't yeah. well I mean I would need I would need like three hours to, to unpack that. But, you know, I, I do think that there's a momentum where a lot of women are saying, yes, I can. I want to do this. I'm interested in that. I'm not going to let people talk me out of it. And I think we are seeing more role models and especially women of color. You know, I mean, I'm thinking of Ishar. I mean, you know, when, when, when young girls see that and go, wow, this really is possible. Not only can I focus on this and make this, you know, my, my passionate commitment, you know, professionally, personally, because you know the changing the world or wanting to change the world is a great driver and also great, I think you know, um, just um, you know an equalizer. And um, and in agriculture, I mean, look, most of the people that make big ag decisions, global big ag decisions, are mostly men. Have been men, and even though women at the you know the micro level do a lot of agricultural work. So when young girls see this you know, this kind of gap, they go, well, how far am I going to get, you know, if I study this, I'm going to, I'm going to hit the, the glass ceiling, the pink ceiling. And I think if we said, look, you know, um, if there's, if there's no more grass, you know, there's, there's no more, you know, there's no more grass ceiling, you know, the agriculture ceiling, so to speak, um, I think we're opening doors and people are going to do a little more than lean in. I mean, I see a very strong female force saying, please get out of the way. You know, I have a right to be here and I have important stuff to contribute. So I'm super excited to see, you know, I see the momentum. So I'm, I'm, I think we're seeing women and, and you know, girls um, make their way in. It's great. Fantastic. Yeah, I haven't heard the term pink ceiling, but that's an apt way to put it. Um, I've heard of glass ceiling everything, but I like pink better. Uh, all right, so maybe we can launch into some other questions too. That was a fantastic start. Um, I'm gonna go back to basics. So uh, can any of you or multiple of you just define cellular ag in one sentence? Like, so if people are just totally confused, what is cellular agriculture? What does that even mean? So one sentence, what is cellular ag? Well, uh, I would start, 
I'll start it and please support me on this. But according to me, I would say it's basically as simple as uh, the production of animal sourced materials through cell culture. Anything I would add? say in, in oh, one sorry. sense for, would be the use of cellular biology and tissue and engineering to produce animal meat outside of the animal. I'm gonna I'm gonna broaden that definition a little bit because um, I think that um, I think that there are some examples of things that would um, be included in cellular agriculture that do not quite fit into either of those definitions. And so uh, the one example I'll bring up is Impossible Foods has a leg hemoglobin molecule, which is a protein that is actually from soy root nodules, and that is made through cellular agriculture and then uh, extracted into an acellular product. But it's actually a, um, it's actually a plant protein, which is being used to mimic a meat protein. So um, yeah, I guess like, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm not sure if that still is included in the definition, but I have, I have seen that as an example, an, a company as an example uh, of cellular agriculture. I would just move to broaden even more. It's using biotechnology to make food. That's simple. Wow, I like it. To make good food, maybe. To make simple, good food. Well, that's up to the chef. Uh, that's true. Maybe not the good part. Yeah, OK. Fair enough. Uh, we have a question in chat. Curious what the process is like to get the cells. Does anyone want to take that on? Well, I think this panel uses a whole bunch of different kinds of cells. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, broadly, there are microbial cells you can use. So bacteria and yeast, and they're often used to produce proteins. There is obviously plant cells that you can use. There are animal cells. So there's a, a lot of diversity about, you know, which cell lines are doing the work here. That's true, just adding a little context to that, uh, since I use animal cells, uh, it's as simple as uh, taking a biopsy from the animal and then growing that cell into a tissue basically inside a lab. So that's the process. But in the future, it is gonna be pretty much only cell lines. I think the dependency on animals being available or having to get the biopsy and then you know, having only a particular amount of time to make sure you know, the sample doesn't, I think this is gonna be, you know, this gonna be best practices, let's just say. Maybe not always, but I think it's gonna be standardized. I'm in violent agreement with Muriel, which is um, the coming of industrial cell lines that make this a scalable process. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great question. Let me move on to the next one. Uh, and maybe we kind of sort of touched on this a little bit, but so there's cellular and acellular ag. Can someone explain the difference between those two things? I think I've, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, a cellular agriculture is what we are calling the process where we use uh, microorganisms like, for example, bacteria or yeast. And maybe another way that it is uh, normally known is as precision fermentation. And one thing that is important to keep in mind is that uh, what we're going to obtain here are organic molecules, like, for example, proteins. And the final product is not really going to contain any live cells at all. Uh, it's going to be only the, the organic molecule that we produce. So that's important to keep in mind. And when we talk about cellular agriculture is where we are, um, is a process where tissues are made outside of a body using this technology called tissue engineering. And uh, the difference is that here, the product is going to contain once living cells. So the product is going to be, be made by the cells. Um, and we can think about, for example, chicken or uh, beef products. Um, so I think that's uh, one of the main differences of both processes. 
Can I add my pithy take on it? I, I so um, a cellular cells make the product. Cellular cells are the product. Yeah, that explains it well. Great, thank you. All right, moving right along. So what are some of the benefits of cellular ag and then maybe some downfalls? Well, I mean, I would say, I mean, there are so many benefits in terms of side-by-side um, -side comparison with traditional or industrial animal agriculture. I mean, you need obviously no animals, so you eliminate animal cruelty, um, zoonotic diseases, antibacterial resistance, um, because you know the majority of antibiotics produced go to um, farmed or domestic animals. You need a lot less water, you need a lot less land. Um, energy is one of the things we could probably discuss as a 50-50 mm, or as often chosen as the issue where people say, but is it really more energy intensive? And it's a complicated answer. Um, but I would say environmentally in terms of human health, animal welfare, um, it is, I would say a necessity um, to ensure that we have a habitable planet by the time we reach 2050 and beyond. So um, that's probably the overarching why we need this, in my opinion. Adding on to that, I feel like another exciting uh, part of aspect of cellular act is the ability to actually uh, design and tune what you're making. So that's something that's super exciting for me as a girl who is super curious from her childhood about how the human body works and what if we put the heart here or there, just drawing parallels from my um, uh, biomedical experience. Uh, for instance, in the cell lag um, terminologies, you could basically make meat with um, more unsaturated fats and lesser saturated fats, or we could make leather with different thicknesses and Currently, uh, we are actually making milk without lactose or eggs without cholesterol. So it, the tunability and the, the flexibility for design and the scope for innovation is something that, that personally excites me. I think another benefit, uh, if we think about really into the future is that with cellular agriculture, theoretically, we can produce food anywhere, wherever we want. And we've been e even uh, seeing how they are trying to produce or use cellular agriculture in the space to produce food in space. So mm -hmm. I think that could be also a benefit if we think about um, we are not going to be dependent of the climate uh, for producing the food that we need. So you're saying all burgers on Mars will be cell-based? <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> okay, cool. um, and did we mention food safety? Isn't, um, wouldn't it arguably be a lot more food safe created in a lab versus a factory farm? Pretty much because I mean, it's a, it's a sterile process and you're eliminating um, contaminants nearly 100%, I would say, I mean, in, in the production process. So absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, awaiting regulation um, in many parts of the world. Um, we'll see what the FDA, USDA has to say or the equivalents in, in other countries. But um, Singapore, I think, made great strides um, being the pioneers of saying, yes, um, it is safe. It's approved for the general public. You can order it, I think, for delivery with Food Panda and uh, Eat Just Right. So people are eating it as we speak. They seem to be fine, as far as I know. Um, and again, what, what everybody said, you, you can improve on the safety because you can control nearly every aspect of this product. And um, yeah, I would say so far so good. We will have to await long-term studies as with all new food products um, or, or drugs or, or su supplements, but so far so good, I would say. 
Um, and I'm going to uh, reject your premise that this stuff will be grown in a lab because at the end of the day, when you're going commercial, it's a manufacturing plant, like a plant where people make yogurt or other foodstuffs or, uh, you know, brew beer. And so, you know, it, it sure there's R&D to get um, cell lines that are capable of doing these things. But at the end of the day, it's a it's a food manufacturing process that on a high level looks exactly like things that people eat today anyway. That's a really good point. Um, and so maybe that leads to another quick tangent or question. There's a variety of different names for this technology from cellular ag to lab grown meat to X, Y, Z, make it up. What do you think? Like, what is the best name for this? I mean, I know that, or I have a feeling a lot of people are just gonna say it's meat, it's dairy, it's, you know, whatever it is because it is, right? But there was a whole kind of debate, an ongoing debate about what do we call this to not um, have the consumer stay away from it, right? Uh, so what kind of name preference do you have for this technology, if any? Well, this is, this is a very long ongoing debate <laughs> that we won't put to bed anytime soon. Um, I mean, the, the consumer studies, right, where consumers are given a choice of five different names. Um, most recently, I think um, Blue Nalu commissioned someone to ask people uh, in relation to seafood what the best uh, descriptor is, and uh, the result was cell-based. Um, it's often called cultivated. Um, cultured, we've retired some other names like clean or slaughter free or, you know, because there was too much pushback. Um, personally, I think we should, because this is a completely new food category, um, I think we should call it Segan. I've written three blogs on this particular topic um, because it's like vegan, but it's made out of animal based materials. So it's vegan in theory, no animals has, have suffered in the process, but it is not vegan food because it is still muscle or you know, it is still meat, even if it's not animal. That's just my personal opinion, my little crusade maybe, um, because I think it would work. I mean, I've been talking to students for two years about this particular topic. And it was funny because at the time they sort of took to Segan in, in conversation without me saying, well, I think we should call it that. And that's why I'm on this, this kind of line because I think it would, it would solve some problems. That, but that's just, you know, maybe that, that's just me personally. That's the anthropological perspective that also connects food and identity. And because why would we have flexitarians? Why reductarians? Why are people trying to find a name uh, that tells a story about what people are eating and what that says about who they are. So I predict and slash hope that people will find something simple that's not too confusing and not too alienating to say, yeah, I'm a Segan. I only eat animal-based foods made by way of cellular agriculture or acellular agriculture or pre precision fermentation. Just my opinion. I would sign up to be a Segan, but I think from the commercial point of view, I want anybody who wants to eat this food to enjoy it, whether they're uh, an omnivore or a carnivore or, or an actual vegan or a vegetarian or a vegan. Um, uh, because at the end of the day, you know, um, as the more people that eat this, the, the better it is for the planet and um, the industry in general. Um, I do think it's really important to be transparent though, because customers today really want to understand what it is they're choosing to eat. And, you know, I think uh, Impossible has done a fantastic job educating the consumer about what they're eating so they're not creeped out. So I don't think we can hide and just call it meat and hope no one notices because that might build distrust. Um, but certainly I will leave it to the marketing people and the regulators to, <laughs> to tell me what it's called. I think one important aspect also is that at the end of the day, the name is gonna also be dependent of the culture of each uh, population that we're talking about. Um, I'm just thinking about, for example, in Spanish, 
we don't have like a word for cultured, so it will be more cultivada, which is more like cult uh, cultivated, but it doesn't mean the same. So I think at the end, uh, every culture would adopt what really reflects their traditions or their um, yeah, culture in general. I just think uh, as Kasia was saying, uh, it's important to be transparent and also you know, mislead the consumers. So she was talking, for example, about the term lab, uh, lab grown, which I also think it's maybe not the most appropriate uh, for these kind of products, because in that case, all the food that we eat will be lab spaghetti or lab chocolate, because everything starts in a lab. So yeah. I really think that um, it doesn't matter the term we use. It's something that people feel comfortable using and that is not misleading. Excellent point. Um, you know, it was mentioned that we want this to be a food that everyone can eat. Um, and I've been kind of following this technology for a little bit and we know how expensive it was to first produce this meat. And how is it becoming more economically or is it becoming more economically affordable? You know, we've got things like food deserts and problems with food security. So how can we ensure that this sustainable food, this food tech um, gets to everyone or anyone who wants to eat it. How can we do this equi equitably um, and fairly? I mean, I think, because um, we're building a scaffold, I think that'll start to make it a little Sorry, right there. <laughs> um, we're building a scaffold, so I think that'll help with the prices. Um, once we fulfill, like, once we figure out what cell lines work with the scaffolds, um, then I think that'll also dramatically cut the cost and help a, a lot. Um, I can throw in my two cents here, which is, um, I think it's really important to get this technology to the market and that's not first going to be initially equitable because the technology cycle is that you know certain populations of wealthy folks are early adopters and you know try something out um, but as those people try it out and validate that there's a market you know there's a huge amount of um, pressure to drive down the cost so that you can um, you know reach more audiences and I think, you know, I'm super excited for folks coming to market in a big way and then quickly driving down costs. And again, I think, you know, Impossible has a great playbook here. You know, they started in sort of boutique premium situations and now you can get an Impossible Whopper at Burger King, which is certainly mass market. So I think, yeah, the goal is to get it out there, period. And then, you know, do all our industrial R&D magic and process development to drive that cost down as much as possible. So that basically, um, you know, ideally we are cheaper than the conventional products available. Yeah, I'll add to that to say that, um, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think about, um, you know, cellular products, they think about the cells. And I think that there's a huge opportunity for people who are more hardcore engineers to really um, push the engineering aspects of, um, of the production. And so making um, industrial processes that are really economical for you know, cell-based meats, as well as um, improving the current um, like precision fermentation equipment and processes as well. I think there's huge, huge room for improvement there. And to make those, um, to make that, those processes also a lot more uh, sustainable and green as well. Yeah, I mean, this is also one of the reasons why a lot of startup companies are working with big ag companies rather than working against them because they have two things that we need. They have the customer and they have the infrastructure. So if there could be a collaboration where you know the rollout could greatly be aided by by these support pillars right so you know yes we we have to you know figure out the scaling and you're right you know this is mostly now an engineering puzzle but you know i think we'll get there just like the the, the entire 
Jim Mellon's Moose Law, you know, like there's going to be a doubling of efficacy and, you know, things are going to reach parity sooner or later. But I think those are the those are the, the means that will get us to that end. And the, you know, the early adopters, people who have the least amount of, you know, um, food neophobia, people who are really curious, people who are like, you know, there's a small percentage who will who will become the catalyst um, to bring this out into um, into the, the the public or the mainstream. So, yeah. Great answers. Um, I'm going to get to a couple in the chat. Um, can people sign up to be part of studies for food safety? If anyone knows. So, uh, you know, I think most toxicology studies are, are unfortunately animal based is my understanding. Um, so I think a lot of that um, early food safety work for the FDA certainly occurs in animal models. Um, but I do think, you know, uh, there are, you know, ways of figuring out how you can get access to this as, as we have so many companies in the Bay Area, I'm sure people will find um, safe ways to hold events where they start welcoming the community and um, doing demos, but I don't, I, correct me if I'm wrong, ladies, but I don't think you can sign up for that. I don't think so. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, okay, and then there's something else in the chat. I'm interested in hearing the panelists' responses to the recent laws prohibiting self-cultured products from using terms like, quote, meat on packaging. Uh, traditional animal ag proponents argue that that consumers will be deceived into purchasing self-cultured products. I don't wanna trick anyone, so. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but I, I'm not really familiar with the details, so I can't really call. I mean, you know, you're not getting butter when you're buying peanut butter. So it, it's, I mean. Yeah, I think it's uh, there. There, I mean, this has like been a, a big, a big issue in Europe um, as well as, you know, can you even call it soy milk or is that too confusing for the consumer? Uh, can you package your soy milk in a container that looks like regular milk? And um, the milk companies are, are, are saying, oh, you can't do that. It's very confusing for the consumer. They won't understand that the soy milk packaged in the milk container is actually made from soy. And so um, I think it like, I don't think anybody wants to deceive um, with soy milk or cell cultured meats or any of these um, kinds of products. But I think, you know, being clear that it's a, you know, how the product is made or what goes into the product on the packaging is important. And then I think it's really has to come though from consumers to say, like, I'm not gonna be confused when I pick up a container of soy milk. So um, I think that it's, it's a consumer, it has to be from a consumer pushback perspective. And I think that's um, what people are pushing for, like in Europe, where they've had these milk, milk problems. I, I, don't, I don't know what to call them. But um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Thank you for sharing. All right. Um, has anyone maybe tasted it? And if so, how was it? What'd you think? Well, I mean, I've only had um, ice cream made with Perfect Day uh, and it's fantastic. I mean, that's the only, um, the only, you know, acellular precision fermentation product that I've tasted. Um, it tastes really good. Are you sure? There's, I think, a lot more ingredients out there. <laughs> um, it's pretty good. Um, I've tasted um, uh, prototypes made with conventional 
uh, cells and unfortunately, um, sorry, conventional meat. Unfortunately, I missed uh, a taste test we did during COVID when it was tear purple. So it wasn't a good time to hang out and uh, taste things, but um, we had some um, expert taste panels and uh, the results, uh, the reviews were great. And um, certainly the prototypes made with conventional meat also taste incredibly good. Anyone else? I'm jealous if you have. Sounds well, like I make that in lab, so <laughs> yes, I have. Uh, what can I say? It does taste like meat. And uh, I just wanted to go a, go a step further and add a little more context and layer to this. The Holy Grail is basically getting that precise or precision or the culmination between taste and texture. And I think that's, that's something that a lot of uh, cell cultured meat companies are trying to establish as well as plant-based companies. So yes, that, the holy grail is the right combination of taste and texture. Unfortunately, I live in Canada, so not even perfect day <laughs> ice cream I've been able to try. So I'm just looking forward to that. Now, I haven't had a chance to taste any of the uh, cultured meats, um, but I have, I've had the uh, perfect day ice cream and it's delicious as well as um, like, you know, impossible whoppers. Um, so those are pretty good too. Awesome. Uh, I didn't know that they had an ice cream. That is tempting. I'll add that to my list. Um, okay, so. How did you each get into this field if you haven't already kind of mentioned it in your intro? I think I can share a little bit of, of my story, how I got involved in Salad. Um, it was uh, when I was finishing my postdoc and I was looking for my next step. I wasn't, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I just started like browsing on the internet, trying to look for potential like options. And um, I came up with the article of Mark Post and, the, and his burger. And I was like amazed by what, what he was doing. And uh, as I said, it's like, um, it was love at first read because I was like, I wanna be involved in this field. This is what I wanna do. It was a perfect combination between my values, my beliefs, uh, my passion for food and innovation and also found it really interesting from a science communication perspective because it was completely a new technology and the way we introduce it was really crucial or it, the way we introduce it is, is really crucial um, so that's how i came up with the field i started looking for companies or people involved here in canada and by that time there was nobody or there were really few people working in in cellular agriculture so I just started reaching out to them and yeah, connecting with them. And then that's how we decided to uh, found uh, Cellular Agriculture Canada. And that was uh, my first, uh, let's say, um, position or job in, in the field. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I briefly spoke about it during my intro, but just to provide more context, uh, post PhD, I was briefly introduced to this uh, food sustainability in Singapore. Uh, the topic was gaining immense momentum there then. And I was curious to see if I could find opportunities to grow within that field. I took a course on entrepreneurship. I took a course on sustainability because that was not something that I uh, invested heavily on during my PhD and before. And then I worked on projects that uh, kind of uh, created sustainable aquaculture fields and also was able to adapt my technical skills to making edible films from byproducts of the food industry. So fast forwarding, fast forwarding a few months, I had to move like halfway across the world and I landed here in the Bay Area in Berkeley. And almost instantly by then I had made up my mind that I wanted to spend the next decade of my career associated with the sustainable food arena. 
And uh, I think UH Meets was also looking for somebody with my skill set. So we were in perfect synergy in our mission. And I don't, looking back at it, I think uh, it's one of the best decisions that I've made. And I'm able to apply all my love for cells, cell technology, to make something that I can uh, directly impact and not just the quality of life for us humans, but also make suffering optional or non-existent for animals. Uh, coming from India, a lot of my relatives and friends uh, shy away from consuming meat just because of the animal uh, cruelty aspect. And I'm glad that I'm working on something that, that could change that kind of a perception for them and a lot of people who think like them. So that's my story. Well, my story is so long. I'm having, I'm going to try really hard to make it relatively short. So as an anthropologist, nobody really knows what to do with me in cellular agriculture, even though I'm extremely passionate about um, education and research. And on the, on the research end, I'm, I'm hoping to work with marketing companies to really craft the story, because I think the story is so critical, you know, on how the public will receive this and engage with it and build a relationship to brands and you know the, the the products themselves but um i i mean i first heard about um cultured meat with a post burger um just like you and i was really fascinated because i've been a vegetarian slash vegan for 30 years and i've tried so hard to educate people about veganism and you know animal agriculture and all this and um and I, I decided to, to talk to my students in my introduction to cultural anthropology class about cultured meat. And I just decided that everybody has to do a little class project because it was just easier to roll it into you know, anthropology. And at first everybody was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And by the end of the semester, they couldn't stop talking about it. They just wanted to know more and they were really engaged. And so I repeated this with three different classes. So every time, you know, intro to cultural anthropology. And in the fall of 2019, I was sitting through final exams and they had, I had tasked them with coming up with a strategy on how to bring cultured meat onto campus. And I just had a very profound moment of realization that this is my purpose as an educator. This is what I should be doing all the time because it's so much fun. It's so important and students take to it um, with such, you know, with, curi with intellectual curiosity, like I have not seen um, in, in a long time. So they were so engaged with this and so excited because it, it related to their own lives. Um, it connected climate change with their own culture, with I wanna do something, but I don't, you know, how do I transform interest into impact? And that's why I started Follow the Future because I wanna you know, bring new people, young people into this field to help shape it and help, you know, help the people in there um, to, to, to shape the narrative because Gen Z is super, super important. And I think they have a lot to say about that. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about young people, young women um, and supporting their path into you know, effective climate change solutions that make for amazingly important and exciting careers in the future. Sorry, too long, but you know, very passionate about the topic, so. <laughs> what were some of their answers to how they could bring it onto campus? Oh, well, again, you know, I, I would rather everybody else kind of like tell their story, but I'd be quite happy to tell you, Aaron, um, on a one on one, but amazing ideas. I mean, some people were like, let's call it the modern kitchen. Let's get away from this lab talk. I mean, so many different ideas. I mean, it blew me away. It was like the it was the best final stay of my life. It changed my life. That's why I'm sitting here. It was so cool. I wrote a little paper in anthropology now with some of their answers and concerns and issues. I mean, that's why I really want to work with students, you know, because I think it's that generation will push um, SALAC where I think it belongs. I mean, I'm very hopeful. Let's just put it this way. Yeah, we'll have to connect one on one with that because working at a university, I'm really interested in the answer. Like, how do we bring this to UC Merced? or the UC Berkeley's or UCLA's or any university or something? I'm, I'm, I'm working on it already and I'd be super happy to talk to you and work with you. It's, 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 it'll be great. 
Yeah, let's chat more. Um, does anyone else want to provide more of that answer? No? Okay. I've got another question I think that might be interesting. We kind of already talked about labels, but um, you know, we have the terms for, or the labels for organic and fair trade. We mentioned Segan, could that be a label? Like literally a label that we stamp on this product? Or are you thinking Segan is more just a term for what us Segans would be? Um, does anyone have any sort of idea about labels? I mean, for me, I would, I would brand, I'm trying to brand the industry, you know, the whole field. So it's not about necessarily the products, but the products would benefit, you know how, okay, on a, on a menu, you have a little V next to something and it lets you know it's vegan or it's vegetarian. So if you put a C on a package, it, I don't think would be that challenging to educate people. Oh, the, see the little C, this means it's vegan. That means it's meat, but it's made without animals. And I find it just easier and everybody, every individual company can of course retain, well, you know, our methodology is more along cell-based or cultured or cultivated. I mean, it's not, it, it's not, and it's not, you know, I wouldn't force it on people. I just, I'm just trying to help think of how do we make it easier for the consumer facing side, right? So, and you know, what you said earlier, um, Yadira, the, there's no word in a particular language. I think Segan would translate rather easily, right? I mean, no, I'm selling this, no. Um, but, um, but for example, if you imagine that companies could have a registry like, oh, these companies all make Segan foods so that it's easy and easy access because people are familiar with vegan. And you know, the, this generation is actually has um, refriended the word vegan where, you know, we had a, a while where we could only call it plant-based because vegan was a bad word. But this new generation actually doesn't have that much of a problem with it. People very readily identify as vegan. And as an anthropologist, I can tell you that food and identity are like this, you know, people need, want to call this something, they want to build a relationship to the product or the series of products, and they want what they're eating, wearing, or how they're living to say something about them. So vegan is not just about not eating meat or dairy products. Veganism is a philosophy. You know, people want cruelty-free lives. They don't want to wear leather. They don't want to take any kind of medication that was tested on animals. They oppose zoos, you know, vivisection. There's a whole range. So veganism may very well follow the same lifestyle, right? I want to sit on furniture that is made without having to chop down trees, right? So I want to eat on a table made out of cultured wood with um, cultured silk. I don't want this to come from animals. I want this to be cultured. I want, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think people will want eventually to extend this idea of veganism to something that includes all the things that they're currently eating or wearing, but these things be sustainable, cruelty-free, take up, you know, arguably only just a few resources. And, um, Again, I'm, I'm just an anthropologist. This is just my perspective. You know, I would love to have a conversation about that, but this is how far I've gotten in my thinking and my talking to people and my experience um, dealing with the, this cultural pathway or barrier, because we can help shape that, right? We can, we can see where the barriers and removing them rather than asking people, you know, would you eat it or, or won't, wouldn't you eat it, but asking why aren't you eating it? Right, so then you understand why people are not doing something already, which is easier, I think, and more productive than trying to, you know, I mean, like you, I don't want to push people to do anything. I don't want to force people, um, but sort of pick pick people up where they are. And um, culture is, of course, extremely important. You have to understand a culture before you can introduce some kind of change, right? And, and this is also something that we do, or, or I would like to do in this field. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's a lot hinges on what we call it and what the story of, of this new product is or should be.
So it is 402 for everyone's sake of time and interest. Uh, I want to make sure that we get out on time a little over. Uh, does anyone have anything like final notes that they want to add? No, okay. Um, thank you so much. This was too short. I feel like we need a follow up discussion. I feel like there's so many other questions that I have now that I want to ask. Um, definitely a lot of uh, inspiration here too. So thank every or I thank everyone for being here and for listening and everything. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. If animal ag is the number one cause of climate change, as this new peer reviewed paper says, maybe this will help your platform. Um, I'll have to look at this later, but um, if everyone wants to grab that from the chat and maybe review it. Um, so to wrap up, just thank you again all for your time and uh, have a lovely Friday. Thank you, Erin. It was nice to meet you, all of you. I hope we can keep talking about this in some form or other. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hey, everyone. It was nice to meet you. Bye. Bye. Pleasure. Bye-bye.